Hi everyone, you're welcome to my channel. I want to talk about necrotizing fasciitis. Necrotizing fasciitis. Some call it flesh eating disease. Flesh eating disease or necrotizing fasciitis is a very dangerous infection of the soft tissue. It has a sudden onset and spreads very rapidly. It causes a great morbidity and very, very high mortality. The risk factors here are skin breach of any kind. Skin breach of any kind, including insect bites, chicken paws, skin piercing, blunt trauma, even major penetrating trauma, inner fissures, hemorrhoids, and its walls if the immunity is suppressed, in other words, immunosuppression. Still on risk factors, obesity, malignancy, alcoholism, pregnancy, diabetes mellitus, all will decrease the immunity and the individual will become more susceptible. Gynecological procedures will be another means through which one can become infected. What are the possible clinical features here? Mostly the lower limbs are affected. That is not to say the upper limbs cannot be, but less compared to the lower limbs. Usually it is acute in onset. It's going to occur within hours and it's going to spread very fast, rapidly progressing with tissue necrosis, anesthesia at the affected region, which means you're not going to feel pain along that region when it is very deep. Crepitus. There's possibility of gas in the tissue and systemic infection will occur very fast. Overwhelming sepsis going into septic shock. The, the, one of the subtle signs is when there is pain, the pain will be out of proportion and there's possibility of death here. When the lower limbs are affected or any part of the limbs, even with the upper limb, there's possibility of edema because there will be inflammatory process anyway. So edema, pain, swelling, fever, echemosis, bullying because there will be gas underneath the skin and later there will be decreased pain sensation later on. That is when the disease has progressed and thrombosis will be formed because there will be nerve damage later on, that is why there will be decreased pain sensation. Then we will start having skin necrosis. And then we are going to have the necrotizing features in there. How do we make the diagnosis? It is clinically made. And that will involve inflammation of soft tissue and systemic instability. So when we see the clinical signs of inflammation and systemic involvement, then we should make the diagnosis very fast. When going to do blood culture and gas in soft tissue on radiographic imaging, so you do X-ray or CT. Surgical exploration is the gold standard for ground staining. And the cuprates there will be anaerobes, 
Clostridia myonecrosis that will be responsible for the gas gangrene. Still on diagnosis, Clostridia perfringis we acquire through trauma, and that is more common. Group A streptococcus or beta hemolytic strep, Staphylococcus aureus, which might be Staphylococcus aureus that is methicillin sensitive, or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. The nomenclature would determine the type of antibiotics that we're going to use. In case we are dealing with necrotizing facilities in the newborn, particularly the neonates, that is the 1 to 28 days of life, it's likely we'll be dealing with problems around the abdominal or perineal region. Why that? Beta hemolytic strep is implicated here, and this infection will probably set in secondary to balanitis after circumcision or omphalitis when the umbilical storm is being touched in any way or we have a procedure involving like a chain blood transfusion and so on and infection sets in or is not properly, probably taken care of and infection sets in through the umbilical storm then the infection is going to spread around the abdominal region and the perineal region as well. There is possibility of having a polymicrobial type. In other words, many microbes are involved, or monomicrobial, just one type of bacteria is involved, and that is likely going to be group A streptococcus. Necrotizing cellulitis is milder, and necrotizing myositis will have group A streptococcus implicated as a causative agent. For near gangrene, we involve the peridium, and that will be very common in men. The laboratory findings will involve Increased white blood cell, that is very obvious because I've mentioned a lot of bacteria just in the last few minutes. There's going to be acidosis here. We'll talk about that later on, lactic acidosis. Then there will be decreased pH, increased C reactive protein and ESR because of inflammatory process going on. We are going to have decreased sodium and increased creatinine and increased lactate. There's possibility of increased creatinine kinase and increased AST. When we have increased creatinine kinase and AST, then we should be suspicious that we are dealing with deep muscle infection deep muscle or fascia infection. Then we will call for blood culture and that should take about two sets. Hot sand will be useful here and of course that's going to be gas gangrene and also you can do your x-ray, you can do your CT, do anything to make appropriate diagnosis with surgical exploration for gram staining. The differential diagnosis, about five of them. And first, I'm going to talk about the cellulitis. In cellulitis, there will be no hemodynamic instability. And when you do your CK and AST, it will be within normal range. If there is no any other problem elsewhere, if it is all about cellulitis, no increased CK, no increased AST. And if you're concerned about pyridoma gangrenosum, then you have the following. There will be presence of inflammatory bowel disease, but there will be slower growth or progression. It's not going to be very rapid within hours, like we find in necrotizing facilities. 
and it's not going to resemble cellulitis or facilities, and there will be no sepsis, unlike necrotizing facility. There will be no need of intensive care, and it is necessary we get this diagnosis right because unlike necrotizing facilities where immediate surgical intervention or surgical exploration is required, surgery will actually was in pyoderma gangrenosa, so no surgery here. It's going to respond to immunosuppression, but in case of necrotizing facility, it is actually immunosuppression that is going to worsen it. There's no need of antibiotics here, but when it comes to the treatment of necrotizing facilities, you're going to see that antibiotics administration is core. There will be negative blood and tissue culture, so we don't need it. But compared to necrotizing facilities, we actually need two sets of that. And the third differential diagnosis is gas gangrene. And the culprit is the Clostridia myonecrosis. The fourth differential diagnosis is pyomyositis. And here, there is going to be abscess formation. Why necrotizing is not having abscess formation, but having gangrenous necrosis. It's also caused by Staphylococcus aureus, which is a possibility in necrotizing facilities with either methicillin sensitivity or methicillin resistance. But the difference here is that pyomyositis will not have systemic involvement, no systemic infection. Are we thinking of D-vein thrombosis here? Okay. The extremity will be swollen just like we'll find in necrotizing facilities. There will be pain and warmth, but the pain will be less severe compared to that of necrotizing facilities, and the fever will be minor. How do we treat? The first thing to do is surgical exploration, and that should be done very fast and as a matter of acute urgency. Amputation may be needed here to save the rest part of the body. Intravenous immunoglobulin will be welcomed, and tazosin intravenously, that is going to be piperacillin tazobactam that is going to cover some anaerobes and pseudomonas, clinamycin for gram-negative and vacomycin from gram-positive, particularly methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus. We are not going to keep this patient forever just watching in 72 hours, we're going to review everything about this patient. If there's a potential, because there's possibility of sepsis and sepsis shock, we can give as oppressors intravenous fluid that is appropriate. And we're going to check for the need for albumin. And hyperbaric oxygen perioperatively will be wise. Prevention. Is it possible to actually prevent this? Yes, of course. But how? Okay. Every close contest, anyone who has come across this affected individual and the contact is immunosuppressed, might be because the contact is having diabetes mellitus, is HIV positive, when coming down with AIDS already, CD4 count is low, or there is immune suppression in other forms like chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or inadequate diet, any form of immunosuppression, then that individual should just have penicillin V, 250 milligrams per hour, four times daily. Or the person who is contacting the affected individual as just surgery, that should be done. Then we're going to want 
or better said that we're going to advise the affected patients against droplets and to minimize direct contact with loved ones, family members, and anybody around them. If it's possible to be isolated, that would be great. Prognosis. Wow. There's high mortality. Very, very high. From 15 to 55% will actually die. Mortality will increase with the following. Older patient greater than 60 years old. Why? The immunity is not strong anymore. And affected individual with renal failure, the mortality will increase. And if there is streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, mortality will increase. Mortality will also increase with clostridia infection with very high level of white blood cells. If surgery is delayed, then we are sending the affected person or persons to the early grave. When there is infection of the head, the neck, the thorax, or abdomen, then the risk of mortality is very high. In conclusion, present early so that you can get a good outcome. Because when you present early, wonderful doctors and nurses will do the right thing for you. I'm wishing the affected people well, their loved ones, and all caregivers that will handle them. So flesh-eating disease or necrotizing facilities is a very terrible situation. Thanks for listening to my presentation and kindly subscribe so that you can get these presentations immediately they're published. Thank you.